Into the wild I'm going, into the wild I am. It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home. Into the wild I'm going, into the wild I am. It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home. Welcome to the Free Birth Society podcast. This is a radical space for women who are ready to celebrate their autonomous choices in birth, motherhood, and beyond. Together, we'll learn about wild birth through personal narrative, we'll explore the politics of birth, and we'll analyze everything that relates to our lives as women from a feminist perspective. Here's your host, Emily Saldana. It's been a wild freedom to be bringing you Ray's story this week on the show. Ray is a fiercely intuitive mother from Trinidad who shares everything from her decision not to get the Rogam shot, to using psychedelics to prepare her mind and spirit for her free birth, to even how she self-pleasured herself into labor. So yeah, I do live in Trinidad and Parenton was never really a it wasn't really big on my radar before I met my partner. But when I met him, we just, you know, everything just kind of moved pretty quickly. And, mm-hmm. and I decided that, you know, I'd like to, to start a family with him. So we decided to do that. And while well, I, we, I was, we were already in this frame of mind where a natural lifestyle is something that we we were trying really hard to, to make a big part of our lifestyle. So that is something that brought us together. So we were plant-based. We didn't want too much medical intervention, that kind of thing. So from, from, from that experience, even, we already knew we didn't, want, we didn't want to be in the medical system. So I had this grand idea of home birthing. So that I planned a home birth. And when I found out about my blood type and how they deal with it after that, everything just like all of my plans had to change. Did you know anyone who had home birthed? Well, actually, my mother had a home birth with my one of my siblings. Oh, okay. And I remember her always telling me, and this was, my sister is like 21. So this is, this is like years ago. I was a child when this happened because I'm 30, how much? 30, somebody, 34, I think, right? Yeah. And um, I remember my mother always saying that that was her best birth and experience because she has like five children and out of each one of them, she was like, you know, that was the best. And I remember us, my, my brothers and I being in one room and she in the next room and, you know, we're just... Everything is just so hushed and, and then we heard the baby crying and everybody was just like jumping up. And I remember how, you know, how exciting it was for us and that kind of thing. And I remember, and well, she always, always says how much of a great experience it was for her. So that was the only person close to me who I knew had a home beauty experience. So I was... I was, you know, I was prepared. Well, I was excited about it from her experience. But you don't really hear a lot of people doing... Well, for me, I didn't hear a lot of people or I didn't know a lot of people who did home bits mm-hmm. other than my mother. And outside of, her, outside of her, her home birth experience, she would tell me about how bad her experience was at the hospital. So I had that contrast from her experience her experiences because she was induced with my with her last child and she told me you know it was so terrible and the pain is so different from natural contractions and and that kind of thing so I already had this these ideas in my mind that kind of you know pushed me in that mm-hmm. direction and so locally you know there isn't much people going on about who with and that doesn't mean that there isn't because when I was preparing for my second birth, I actually came into contact with a girl in Tobago, which is our sister Isle. 
and she had a home built home built unassisted. So um there, wow. there probably are people doing it. Yeah, but it isn't, you know, it isn't widely known or discussed. Yeah. As yeah. far as I'm concerned. You know? So I was prepared to do the home bit because I, I felt that it would be the better experience and um, I wouldn't have to put myself with that medical stuff. But they told me that I couldn't, especially because of it was my first birth. And there's a rule here in Trinidad that first birthing, first birth, first time mothers aren't allowed to do home births because of the risk and whatever. So some people say it's illegal, but then there are some people who say, no, it's not illegal. It's just not encouraged. But midwives, when you talk to the midwives, they will tell you, you know, it's illegal to, to do it for your first, as a first time mother. So I was shut down with that from the first and then because of my blood type, which is um, RH negative, they said that I was high risk. So I could not do a home birth, especially because of that mm-hmm. situation. There is a home uh, birthing center in Trinidad called Mama Toto's. You can go there and you can have like water births and that kind of thing. But it was really, really costly and I, I really couldn't afford it. And I didn't know if they would accept me because I was a first time mom and and also because of my blood type. I didn't know how lenient they would yeah. be about it. So I didn't even bother. Me. And, and well, I couldn't afford it because it was like, but like 15,000 or something. It was a lot of money. And I just, I just couldn't afford it at that time. So I was left with just the hospital. I did my, I did a regular um, prenatals. I, I saw a private doctor, got my ultrasounds, that kind of thing. And then in my seventh or sixth month, six months, yeah, I decided to join. There's, we get free healthcare here. So there's um, a clinic a health center that you go and you get, we, you get your prenatals done there. If you are going to go to the public hospital, um, and they were very upset that I took so long, <laughs> that I took so long to come to them, and then they were also very upset because I refused to take the rugam, the rugam shot, which is mm. the shot you have to take as a RH negative mom. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that decision making. That you like, why didn't you take it? Is it just because it didn't feel intuitive and that's kind of, that's not that common, right? That women are denying it. So I'd love to hear how that was for you. Well, at that time, I did some research, right? And research said that, you know, it's not really necessary with with your first child. But if you have a second, plan to have a second child, then you'd have to have to get it. But I just, it just didn't feel right to me. Like what they were telling me, about you know the ne- the necessity of it, it just didn't make sense that my body would attack my baby. Mm-hmm. It, it, I just I it it just didn't feel right. I felt like there was something built in to to deal with something like that, you know. As yeah, because we're made so we're made so wonderfully. Like everything <laughs> in terms of in terms of pregnancy, everything is created perfectly. Like you don't even have to do anything when it comes to growing the baby. You just literally have to be there as a host, right? And make sure that the conditions are optimal and everything functions. Like I don't consciously, I'm not consciously growing the baby. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I, I was just thinking that we, we, we were not made, you know, with flaws, like flaws like, like that. If you understand what I mean. Yeah, so, of course. I love it. I just, I just didn't feel like it made sense and I didn't feel comfortable with other people's blood inside of me mm-hmm. because it does what it is. It's like plasma, different, different blood that, that they pull together and they <laughs> inject you with it. And I did not feel comfortable with it yeah. because I'm like, you know, yeah. this blood is something really spiritual. This is, this is not a joke, you know, why would, I don't even know. What, you know, what is inside of this? How, why would I take it inside of me? So I, I kind of tried to, to get some, some leeway. So I told them, you know, I'm going to wait because they said you, ha- you can take it in like 20 something weeks and then another one. And then, or you can take it after you had the baby. So I mm-hmm. told them, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to take it when I have the baby. 
just giving giving myself some some room because I I still was uncertain because they were telling me that I would never be able to have another baby again and I'll have multiple miscarriages and just a lot of a lot of fear mongering by the doctors. Mm -hmm. So I I had two minds about it then. But when I had the baby, I was in the hospital and I was like, I'm not taking it. And they brought they brought a doctor across to 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 talk me into taking it with all of the, you know, what if you have a baby and your baby has some kind of birth defect and you have to deal with this for the rest of your life. And, 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 you know, things like that, like they were telling me things like that, that I would have problems getting pregnant again. And da, 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 da. and I was mm-hmm. just there with my baby and I was like, no, I'm not taking it. No, I'm not taking it. And they, they were just getting really upset with me. And like when I'm asking questions and I'm telling them, you know, I don't think it is all as is as safe as you all are saying and, you know, whatever. And they're just, they're just getting more angry. And on my form that they gave me to discharge me, they have in red that um, the patient was, was um, counseled multiple times to take the shots and they still refused, you know, in red, like, you know, I'm in trouble. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> you know, right. And it was just, it, it's just crazy how they, they you don't really have much of a choice when once you enter the public health mm-hmm. system, you kind of give your power over to them. So, but I still got out of it, thankfully. Um, but my experience there giving birth made me say to myself for certain, I, I'm not going back. I'm not going back there to have another baby. Because it it was like it it wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. good at all. I mean, I've heard women stories being even worse, right? But just so, like for one thing, when I got there, there were there were no beds for me, so they just had me like I was in a room with another woman, <sighs> and she had like she had like a pad on. And and she's telling me, you know, she's waiting to be stitched up. They 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 have to stitch her up, so they just they just blocked they just blocked mm. her area there to to collect the blood in the meantime. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm 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 there. I'm having contractions, and we're just in this room with all kind of different things stacked inside of it. And then they took me and they moved me to where where the burden area is um and they're just like cloths like curtains separating mm-hmm. each bed so they put me between one and i'm hearing the person next to me she's a spanish because right now we're having a lot of um we have a lot of immigrants coming to trinidad from venezuela so there's a spanish person in the in the bed next to me and she is they are, they are quarreling with her, like, Miss Sanchez, da, 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 we tell you, stop pushing. Oh. Da, 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 and they like that. And I'm just seeing, I'm just seeing blood. I'm just seeing blood oh. gushing. And I'm, I'm there now. And remember, I have, this is my first time. I've never done this before. And I'm there, and I'm like, wow, is this, this is what, this is what, um, um, this is what's coming for me, you know? Mm. It just, it had me, it, it scared me. Yeah. Um, that's super scary. <laughs> it's like a preview of the abuse that's coming. Right? The, and, and the thing is, every time you hear a mother talk in Trinidad about their experience in the hospital, it's never a good one. They mm-hmm. always talk about how the midwives treat you terribly and, and they don't have any compassion and they don't understand how women who are also mothers, how they can treat a birthing mother Mm -hmm. in that type of way you know without any understanding and compassion and but if if they know you you'll get a different type of treatment and and that kind of thing um so i went in there already expecting to be treated badly Uh. but luckily for me my mother's friend she was on she is a registered nurse and she, so she took me to the hospital and she was there with me for a while so they knew that she knew me so i think that i got better treatment mm-hmm. because of that relationship that i had with that woman even the area where where w- the mothers go after having the baby mm-hmm. like that area is just this it's like a 
concentration camp as uh. far because it's just it's just rows of beds and and everybody just looking so it it just it's not i i don't think it's it's ideal for bringing new life into this world you know you'd expect a cherry you know it it was just dull and 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 it was a night i i couldn't wait i can wait to get out of there before i from the time i was done because i don't even remember everything in the experience because it just it just i just kind of suppressed it right but from the time everything was done and they gave me my baby and i was breastfeeding and they were wheeling me out i was like i'm not i'm not coming back to this place mm-hmm. i'm not going to do this like this ever again i made up my mind from then that i was not going to do it <sighs> good for you <laughs> so then what happens <laughs> So um, three years passed <laughs> and I planned for three years to pass. Um, I wanted to give myself time to my body to regenerate and that kind of thing before I try again to have another baby. So when I was ready, I, I, my partner and I discussed it and we just tried. I could remember, I could remember. So I was tracking ovulate, my ovulation, right? And I remember feeling that egg release what? because I read about yeah i was reading online and they're saying that you know some women can feel the egg because you get the cramp you get like a cramp in mm-hmm. feeling and some people could tell when they release an egg during ovulation and i don't know if it's because i was so focused on that ovulation time and just really wanting wanting it to happen that i was in so in tune with everything and i i know i could be crazier but i felt as though <laughs> I felt it release and I told my partner, hey, I feel it. Come, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> like we did it and I was pregnant. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so every time. Yeah, it worked out really well. And so this time around now, I'm even more confused about the rogam shot, especially because right. from everything that I was reading, they're like the second baby, more so than the first when you will need, absolutely need to get the shot. And everybody that I spoke to in the medical fraternity told me the same thing. You know, you need to get the shot. It's important. You, you know, this would happen. It's a bad thing. This, that, and the other. And I was just, I just didn't want to do it at all. I didn't want to do it at all because I took a, a blood transfusion with my first because they told me that my iron was really low. Oh, it was low and for, by their standard and they gave me a blood transfusion and I swear I, I felt... Wait, wait, wait. In, in your pregnancy? Yeah, like a few weeks before I gave birth. Whoa. Gave me a blood transfusion. They, they told, they gave me blood because they said my iron was low and yeah, they gave me, they, well, they told me that I had to take it or else I could bleed out. Well, you know, all the, all the terrible things that could happen if I don't take it. So I gave in. I, I cried the entire time. I felt, I felt as though I wasn't the same person for wow. a period of time in my postpartum. I felt, I felt different, you know, like I was battling with a lot of inner turmoil. And I, I, I honest, I believe it's because of the different blood. <laughs> I could be crazier, yeah? but just, you know, it's not my blood and it's somebody else's blood. And, you know, mm-hmm. that's inside of me. And I just, but I went through a period that things just didn't feel, I didn't feel like my old self at all. So wow. coming from that, it made me even more suspicious of the shot. Mm-hmm. Then I started reading about blood, the people getting blood diseases from the shots and, you know, different things that they're saying that it's not fully, it's not properly studied especially long term especially for the mom they do they they say that it's safe for the baby but there isn't any studies really on how it affects the mother but they just give this general thing that you know it's safe i was even more you know up in arms about it and i already decided that i was not going back to the hospital yeah. some way i was going to do it at home but i was just thinking home birth and then I listened to Phoenix Wild. 
she had a YouTube video and she spoke about the Freebird Society that she, because she was pregnant at that time. And she said that, you know, she spends a lot of time, her favorite pastime is listening to the Freebird Society. <laughs> oh, podcast. Phoenix in, uh, on Kauai. Yeah. Yeah, I love her. Right? I think she has a, her story here as well. But Uh huh. So I listened to her and I said, whoa, the Freebird Society, okay, I need to check this out. And then I started doing research on orgasmic birthing and it led me to Freebird Society as well. So I started listening to the podcast and I was like, shit, women do this? I could, <laughs> I could do this without any help? Oh, shit, don't shut them up. I was like, I was really excited, right? So I was, I was consuming the podcast. Like I was just listening to podcast after podcast because it was making me feel really empowered. Like, you know, this is something I can do. I don't mm-hmm. need to go and get any prenatal. You know, I can do this. I don't need to, right? So I listened to like Jinty Fell. I, I listened to a good bit of podcasts before I reached out to you and asked you if there were any podcasts that dealt with rogam shots, refusing the rogam shots, and you directed me to, um, I think it's your land. Mm-hmm. But when I listened to it, she said that she had like eight children and she, she never took a rogam shot. Mm-hmm. And listening to her story, it, it, it was the final blow. I was like, okay, good. I am going to do this. I am not. I'm not going to go for any regular prenatal because every time I went to to the health center for my first pregnancy, I would come back home feeling really frustrated. I didn't feel good after. Like I would feel worried because you would go on one person and say, wow, your belly is really small for for, 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 um, your your date. And then somebody else would be like, but you're a small person. You know, you can't really have a big, big belly. And this is the fracture of a woman's intuition because you're over here having, you're obviously a very connected, intuitive woman and mother, but then the people who have co-opted authority over, you know, pregnancy in our bodies are telling you, you need something that in your bones, you know, is wrong. It just really highlights, yeah, just the fracture of, of, of what industrial birth does to us. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it really is. Uh, I, I don't even want to, it just makes, it makes me feel really sad thinking about mm-hmm. what they do to women. Um, and cause like my mother told me this story. She said that when she was pregnant with one of her children, one of my siblings, she was really, she said her face was her, like her nose was swollen and she, she said she, was, she found that she was so unattractive. And when she went to the health center, she heard a nurse saying, gosh, was it? you ugly. <laughs> like she heard a nurse talking about how ugly she was looking. Oh and it God. just, that it just, yeah. And she said she was so depressed because she was already feeling unattractive. And then this, this nurse vocalized how unattractive she really was looking so this is where they have us Mm -hmm. right now in these places what they do to us and how they make us feel in this very sacred time so at what point so you you get pregnant and you're thinking home birth you start listening to free birth society and then you're just like it's on this is what i'm this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And, and who yeah. do you, how does your partner feel about it? And, and who do you plan? Like, how do you assemble your team? Do you tell anybody? Do you stop going to the doctors to like tell us? I never went them? to the doctor. I okay. never took a pregnancy test. Wow. I never wow. went to a doctor. Um, I told him, he was, he said, you know, yeah, if that's what you want to do, I'm here for it. I told my mother, she was very, very concerned. She tried to, you know, she tried to get me to change my mind, but not in a very forceful way. <laughs> and, you know, naturally she would be concerned. So, mm-hmm. I, and I only told very close people to me um, about it. I tried to find a midwife though, because my mother was like, at least having a midwife, you know? So I said, okay, maybe I can have a midwife for this one. And then the next one, I'll just do it totally by myself. And because during that time, a friend of mine, she died in 
during childbirth. She oh and her baby God. died at a oh private hospital. Yeah. Um, oh. So I kind of, I was really, <laughs> it was a really weird time. Somebody sent me like the day before, somebody sent me a nurse that I was talking to, to potentially be my midwife. She sent me an article about a mother whose, babies, whose baby died and she did a home birth. And then the day after, my friend died at the hospital. So yeah. I was like, you know what? It really doesn't matter. You know, it could, it, <laughs> there is no guarantee regardless of where you decide to go. I just have to take, mm. um, I have to be accountable. I have to take full responsibility for whatever happens. And I kind of just started to shift my, my mind into that space of, being fully responsible for what happens, whatever happens. And my partner, he was very helpful with that because, you know, you know, talking about that and, and, and babies and that kind of thing. So I had him there really supporting me through, you know, getting my mind, getting me mentally prepared for whatever, whatever could happen. Um, so I saw a midwife in my 25th week. And she was uncertain if, and this was the first time I heard my baby, I heard my baby's heartbeat and got any real confirmation from anybody outside of my home that I was having a baby and the baby was alive and well. But she, in order for her to decide if she would be my, she would attend my birth, I had to take an anomaly scan and she needed to know that my iron, my iron was, you know, good. And the more I thought about the anomaly scan, the more I didn't want to do it. So mm-hmm. I, eventually we just decided that I'm not going to do, go that way because I didn't want to do the anomaly scan. I didn't yeah. want an ultrasound. That, that was it. That was the only person that was supposed to be part of my birth team. Um, I had a friend, a uh, sister that I initially said, you know, maybe you can come and you can help me with, with my son because I, I wanted my, I didn't want my partner to be overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I, I, that didn't work out. <laughs> I told my mother, maybe you can come, but I already, I just told her that to pacify her. Because <laughs> mm. I knew I didn't want her to be there. <laughs> I knew I didn't want her to be there because I, I knew I wanted, I had an idea for what type of energy I wanted in terms of it not being panic or hysterical and that kind of thing and I didn't think my mother could manage yeah. not panicking especially with just us so um, I told her that but then she's like I, I feel you're not going to call me you know <laughs> so <laughs> early on I already knew that I wasn't going to do that and um, actually I spoke to another with midwife as well outside of the one that I saw. And when I told her that I was Irish negative, she was like, no, 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 no. It's not ideal for you to, to, to give birth at home. I wouldn't be, I, I can't do this. You know? And I was like, but so she's like, y'all, y'all usually don't have, y'all come from a place of ignorance. Y'all don't really have the information. And you know, that's what this woman is telling me after I spent months, months just, you know, going through as much information as possible around the Rogam shot and if it's necessary mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. And she's like, You probably knew more than her. Yeah, because she didn't even know it was plasma, you know. She's like, No, that's that's not what I was like, okay, ma'am. And I just I said, Okay. That was the last person I tried to see. And I said, you know what, Chris, that's my partner's name. I said, We're we're just going to have to do this on our own. Because even Mm -hmm. if I decided to go to the hospital, they would have insisted that I had to take the Rogam shot. And I made up my mind that I was not going to take it. So I I was like between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. So I I made a decision and that was both of us will do it. We'll do it at home together. I'll get as much information as possible. I spoke to the girl who, who gave birth a couple, well, a few months before it, I was due, I spoke to her and I found out how she prepared, um, you know, what, in, what advice she had. And after speaking to her, I felt, I felt, I felt really good as well. So nice. yeah, that was it. That, that's my big theme. <laughs> so tell us about your free birth. Uh, so this was 
what night was that? Anyway, I don't think it matters, but I had my baby on the Tuesday, right? So Tuesday night, I started to feel contractions, but I was thinking it's Braxton Hicks because weeks before I was, I was feeling, I was feeling getting Braxton Hicks, but I was using that time to um, practice for what, what it would be like, you know, how I'm going to deal with it during during that time so every time i would get the con- deep racks and hicks i would you know breathe into it and and you know just prepare myself so tuesday night i started getting contractions and then they were a bit um regular but not like five minutes or whatever i was able to sleep through the night and I woke up in the morning and when I used the bathrooms, I was thinking to myself, what if, what if I see a bloody show, you know, in the morning? That would be really awesome. And I did. When I went to use the bathroom, I saw, I saw, you know, and I got really excited. But not too excited because I'm thinking, you know, this doesn't mean that this is going to happen today. It could be next week or whatever because my mm-hmm. due date was the 25th based on the internet. <laughs> since I didn't have any doctors. Um, <laughs> so... The 25th was my due date, and this was probably like the 16th or something like that. So that day, I it was I had some contractions throughout the day, nothing, nothing, you know, regular or too consistent or whatever, nothing too painful. Um, and my neighbor actually was also having a baby due this the 22nd. I'm due the 25th, so I went over to them, and she also had a bloody show that same morning. <laughs> that's cute <laughs> yeah it was right so that night I was I started to get the contractions were so consistent that I couldn't sleep I couldn't sleep through them so I was awake I was awake all night and I actually used that time to do some self-pleasuring because I did a lot of that leading up <laughs> <laughs> leading up to my due date. I was just, I was going crazy. <laughs> but, um, so I used that time. I used that time because my son was sleeping and Chris was also sleeping. And I just left him, I let, I let him sleep because I was thinking that, you know, he would need to have his rest because he'd have to look after the baby, and, well, my son, and look after me as well. So mm-hmm. I, I, went through my contractions alone, which, and that's what I wanted. I didn't really want to be talking to anybody and doing anything with anybody. So, um, I self pleasured. I, I, you know, I, 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 I enjoyed that. Honestly, it was an enjoyable kind of beginning, to be honest. It wasn't terrible, even though I couldn't sleep, but I was still thinking that I have a lot of time to go. You know, this could be, two days or whatever. So that morning now, around nine o'clock, I realized that they started to be more consistent. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe day after. And the thing is, I spoke to my mother the day before when I, when I had my bloody show and I told her, you know, I'm seeing whatever. And she said, I was, I was pr- talking to God this morning. <laughs> I was talking to God this morning and, you know, I prayed and I asked him to, to make sure I want you to have it, have a very fast and hot birth. And she said that she felt really, she felt like a calm come, come over her and she wasn't worried anymore. That's what she told me the day before. Mm, and it made me feel nice. really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It made me feel really good because she told me she wasn't worried. She knew that was, everything will be fine. Right, so around nine o'clock, it started being more consistent and a little bit more painful. But I kept, you know, I was breathing through it because I, I did a lot of research on, you know, how to prepare. I did my, um, I was using spinning babies and doing their um, exercises every day. So I did those exercises before to make sure baby head down, sunny side up. So I did those and I'm just breathing through it. I asked my partner to go outside with my son because they, they were annoying me. They were just talking too much and asking me too many questions. So I was like, <laughs> leave me alone. Just, just go outside, right? So I labored alone up until it really was like too much to bear. And um, mm-hmm. I kept thinking to myself, expansion, release, 
welcoming. Like I just, I kept telling myself those words so that I'll remember, okay, I'm expanding, you know, don't, don't fight it. Don't tense up. So I, I was really trying to just lean into it, which is what I was practicing with my Braxton Hicks. So I wasn't timing it either. So I, I don't know. I wasn't timing it because I just didn't want any, I didn't want any distraction. I just wanted to be, mm-hmm. you know, focused. And also I didn't tell you that I was using psychedelics to prepare as well for my booth. So I was using mushrooms because that's my, that's my thing. So I was using mm-hmm. psychotropic mushrooms to prepare for my booth in terms of the experience. And um, I'm so grateful that I did that. Like I took a trip at the end of my first trimester and the end of my second trimester. And in that second one, a lot of things came up that I needed to address with my partner in order for us to be prepared because I I was wondering Mm -hmm. if he would be able to hold space for me the way that I needed space to be held. So in that trip, I was able to bring that up and we were able to work through it and that kind of thing. So after that, I really felt prepared you know, as a unit for us to do this thing. So um, when I really started to get, it was like really, it started to become kind of unbearable. And he appeared, like he came just when I needed him. And I started to cry Mm. and I started to tell him, you know, you know, I'm trying to be strong. I'm trying to be strong. And he's like, you are being, you are being strong. Come on, you're being strong. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be feeling happy now. And I'm, you know, you're going to meet a baby (laughs) now soon. And and I'm just again irritated with him. And and I'm like, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. This is the last time. (laughs) And he, he said, he said, you know, you know, it's, it's really up to you, Ray. You know, it's up to you if you want, if you don't want to do it again. And, you know, I started to tell him, you know, I can't go anymore. And he started to tell me, you know, you're transitioning. Because that's that's what I told him. I told him anyone right. you hear me. So sweet. I'm so <laughs> proud of him. <laughs> right. And that's what I heard in the podcast. Like I heard everybody talking about this transition. And they felt like they can't go anymore. But I nev- I didn't experience that with my first birth. So I didn't think it was real. Even though I told, like I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any reference. But I still mm-hmm. told him, and I told him, if you hear me start to say those things, remind me that I'm transitioning, which, which he did. And in my response, in my mind was, why don't he shut up? You know, why, why, what's happening? You're telling me. <laughs> because I'm still thinking that I have real long to go again. Yeah. Yes, I'm not testing anything. There's nobody checking to see how far I'm dilated. I'm just, I'm just going based on, on how I'm feeling, you know, the intensity of the feeling. So I started to feel this, so he's, he's, he, you know, he held me up, he pressed, he gave me some back rubs, you know, while I'm crying and, and feeling mm-hmm. like, you know, I can't go anymore. And I started to feel this, this pressure, like in my, my rectum area and that kind of thing. And I like, oh, what is this? I can't, I can't deal with this. <laughs> you know, that's how I was feeling. And, you know, he, he's encouraging me and he's telling me, Maybe you should try another position. What if you change this position? What if you get up and walk? And, you know, but I didn't want to walk because I, like, I would kneel in a position. I would kneel down and lean over the chair between contractions because it was, I can feel them coming. Like it's going to come. And when I feel that it's going to come, then I would raise up and I would get myself in a position that it was most Mm -hmm. soothing for me. Um, But lying down it was hard for me to get up and get into the position. So I just spent totally. most of my time kneeling down like that, right? So when I felt I, I'm feeling the pressure and he started to tell me, you know, Ray, it seems like it's, it's really, really close. It seems like they're coming close, but I wasn't even thinking about how close they were coming. I just thinking I have real long to go again. So he said, maybe you should, um, maybe you should get up and walk. And I said, you know what? I feel like I need to use the bathroom. So I go into the bathroom and um, I, I have, I'm feeling that pressure and I'm trying to, cause I'm thinking that I need to, you know, do do. So I'm pushing and I'm pushing and nothing is happening. And I, <laughs> I, I go into the bathroom and I'm bent over because I'm feeling that pressure down there. Like I'm feeling that pushing down there. Um, 
and I washed my hands and I put my hands inside and I felt something soft. Um, mm. And I pushed a little higher up and then I felt something, a little hard something. So I came out because all throughout the day, like when I used the bathroom, I kept using the bathroom because I, in my research, that's what I, that's what I learned. That to keep emptying your bladder so mm-hmm. that you could have room and that kind of thing. So I was drinking a lot of water and using the bathroom a lot. So when I came out of the bathroom, I told him, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling something, but it's soft. <laughs> I'm feeling something mm-hmm. soft. And he's watching me with this worried look and my son is running around. He's asking me, mommy, are you having cramps? You having cramps? <laughs> Aww. You know, he was just, he's just concerned, right? Um, so Chris is looking at me really worried, like, you know, what, what, what does that mean? Because I'm just, I tell him that I'm feeling this soft thing. And I told him, you know, I'm feeling something hard as well, higher up. So maybe something is happening. So he just, he just runs. Meanwhile, he's cooking. So he has, everything is going on in our day, like regular with both of them. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> right and um so he runs outside and he just brings he brings some cushions and and towels and he just puts it on the ground right outside the bathroom door and um he, he drops it there and he tells me okay what, what's happening because he, he's starting to look concerned at this point because we we, we, we really not sure what happened in here right mm-hmm. so um, i just i felt and i realized now that it was the um ejection reflex that's what they call it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right so he just lays it down and i i feel that when i feel that that pressure i started to push and i gave what he told me you know i'm seeing the head i'm seeing the head i was like you serious hmm. and i gave a really i gave a, a loud ball <laughs> And I gave a massive push and my son ran outside because he said I was being too loud. So he ran outside and the baby's head was out of me, but the rest of her body inside of me. And I'm just there with Mm -hmm. her dangling and I'm like, I'm done. (laughs) I told him, I'm done. I can't go anymore. And he's watching me like, Ray, are you crazy? How are you you mean you're done? It's like, I can't, I can't go anymore. Right. And he's like, no, I'm seeing her head. And it's like, okay, okay, wait, give me a minute. Give me a minute. And with the next contraction, um, I gave a push and I just, I, and the thing is, uh, when her head came out, I felt it's like time slowed down just for me alone Mm -hmm. because Hmm. I felt like I could feel the ring of fire that they talk about, but I don't, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad, but it happened quickly, like her head came out quickly, but it also seemed like I felt everything in her emergence. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That it just yeah. felt like it's yeah. like it slowed down. And when I gave the next push for her and her body came out, it was just it was just a great relief. And mm. we didn't know what we were having at that point. So he gave her to me because he was there to catch her. He gave her to me and we found out it was a girl and we were just, we were just Mm. overjoyed because I was like, oh my gosh, we did it. You know, we actually, you know, we really did it. And it just seems so, it seems so natural and so easy because my man cooking food, my son running around in the house. Right, exactly. Right. And I'm here, you know, going through it you know, with my thoughts and whatever. And it just felt like this is how, this is how it's supposed to be. This, this is how, mm-hmm. this is natural, right? And he gave her to me and <laughs> I, I just thought I put her on and she, cause she started, she started screaming as soon as she came out. So she, she, she started crying and she pooped as soon as she came out. So I didn't have to worry about anything in terms of, after care at that because I was concerned about if you know she came out and she wasn't breathing you know what would I do mm-hmm. and that kind of thing but I didn't have that to worry about because she was ready first she was nice. ready <laughs> um and we st- I started to breastfeed her and uh, I'm sitting there and I'm feeling this pressure I'm feeling this pressure still down there. And I told Chris, you know, I can't really sit down. I'm feeling, feeling, I'm feeling something there. And something just told me push. And I just gave a little push. 
and my the placenta just slid out. Oops! It was it was just <laughs> like like fifteen minutes passed, and it just it just it just it just came out. I just gave a push, a nice. little push, and it just it just it just came out. And that was another thing my mother was telling me. You know, you have to be concerned about sometimes the placenta just go back up instead of back down, and the the things like that with some of her concerns, but placenta came out and, you know, everything was just perfect. It it was just perfect. And Chris finished cooking. I sat down in my room on my my chair and I had a meal with my baby (laughs) breastfeeding full of of blood and and amniotic fluid. And it was just, Mm -hmm. it was just, it was amazing, mm. to be honest. It sounds amazing. It was a really, it was an, an amazing experience. So then afterwards, how is it for you? How has it been in your community? Have you, do people know? Have you told people? What's been the response? I told people after. So um, my neighbor, who I told you, she was having a baby as well. Mm-hmm. Her mom is a police officer. Um, so we really didn't want her to know. But afterwards, Chris was so overjoyed. He went and he told her that, you know, we had the baby <laughs> right at home. <laughs> and she did not believe it. She did not believe that that happened right there because she saw me like the morning. And she came across and she's like, wow, this is amazing. You know, everybody is so amazed by it and everybody is telling me that I'm so brave and they they just want to hug me and I'm such a warrior and I'm such a you know and I don't feel that way (laughs) not that I I know that what you know just giving birth is a very marvelous you know strong thing to do but just birthing your baby at home without any medical authority I'm thinking that this should this is something normal. Anybody anybody could do it if they decide mm-hmm. to. So I don't feel like I did anything super special. But because of how because of how we are conditioned currently, it seems like such a big thing to everybody who found out. Mm-hmm. So my mother told her friends because she was just she was overjoyed. And <laughs> you know, the response will mix like some of them were telling her, Ray, crazy boy, she has to go to the hospital. And my mother's like, my grandchild is fine. She's breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. She's this, you know. So there's a mix. But a lot of people think that I'm really brave. And I'm, I just think that, you know, I took, I, I took my life into my own hands, you know. My life and my baby's life into my own hands. Which is, which is brave, you know, like I get what you're saying, you know, just the, the act of allowing physiological birth to happen, that part might feel really simple, but the way we've been conditioned and socially, it's not simple. It, it is, this is really a very, very big deal for, for your family, for your community, for everyone who will hear your story. You know, and and that is, I I love it. I love it so much that the most simple, natural thing is also (laughs) like this like super radical thing because it's, I mean, I don't love it. I actually wish the norm was, was this, but we are getting there and, and, and it's the norm for your family now. Like people ask me all the time, do you ever think free birth will become the norm? And I'm always like, well, it is for me, like all my friends free birth everyone like my community all does it it is the norm over here in my part of the world so you know you have to decide if it's the norm for you but for me it totally is right yeah well it's the norm for me now as well you know that's why i reach out to you to show you my gratitude because i swear the podcast really showed me that you know it is possible I can do this alone there are so many women doing giving birth how they choose to give birth and even their prenatal care and that kind of thing that is not is not dependent on the system we can do this and it really really empowered me and gave me the tools it helped me help give me the tools to 
to do this and make that decision. And I'm so grateful. I'm so happy that it's here available because I'm always telling people, go listen. Every Anybody that I know who is pregnant, I tell them, go listen to the podcast. <laughs> awesome. Because I, I know how, it, it's, it's so useful. It's so impactful if we, if we take it seriously. So yeah, but it has been, and, and the thing is, the experience this time was totally different from the experience that I had the first time. I felt as though I gave birth for the first time. Like this was my mm. first time because I was able to experience everything I was able to experience my body for myself. Right. You know, not based on anybody telling me, push, push, this, let me burst your water bag. You know, nobody else but me, you know? So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I feel even more empowered having this experience than my first experience. So my postpartum was even different from how it was with the first with my first child, even my partner, I could see how him being there to catch the baby, how, what kind of influence and effect it had on him because I could see that he was in a bubble. Like up to, up to now, he still looks at her and tells her, you know, I caught you, you know, I, daddy caught you. So hmm. it's not just, it is not just an empowering experience for the mother, but also for the father and the children around because my son also he acts you know she came she came you know from your belly and he he has he has a greater understanding of what that is and what what is happening based on how he talks about it after Mm -hmm. because he still he still talks about it to to, now we're like seven I, i bet yeah so it is overall for everybody involved a much better experience because in Trinidad the father cannot go into the nobody could go with you into the birthing space god even that right you birth alone right that's okay that's just absolutely horrific and super yeah. uh like what's the right word there <laughs> like antiquated like it's crazy that that kind of abuse is still yeah happening but even more than that how profoundly different, like you're saying, to have the family birth together. You know, this baby was made together and obviously it's you birthing, but to have the, have your partner who just sounds so adorable in the birth, you know, get, get to, I mean, it's a family birth and that's, that's just, it's everything. It's so bonding. It's so good for the father and the baby also, yeah, of course, yeah. to have that experience. And the child, you know, your older, your son, you know, if you had gone back to the hospital, he's like X'd out yeah. of the whole yeah. situation, yeah. which is pretty weird. It is. It's, it's crazy. It's just, I don't understand it because my partner had to wait outside he had to wait outside crying he didn't know what is happening because oh. there's no contact like they just they just cut you off from every i can't you can't talk to anybody else. like they just cut you Dude. off it's it's even That's it's insane. too isolating and after my partner because i didn't get my my placenta with my first birth either i don't even remember birthing it I don't have any memory of it. But after he buried it, because he buried it on the same day in our kitchen garden, and he came back and, well, him and my son, they both went out and they buried it. And he came back and he he told me, thank you for giving me such a beautiful experience because it was a beautiful thing for him to do that and bury it and, and, and give power to it in that kind of way. And he was so grateful to me hmm. for allowing him to have that type of experience just imagine hmm. if we had more cases like that you know uh-huh. how much I, i'm wondering if fathers would be more active in in their children's life if they they are actually there of course you know yeah. you know things like that i'm just thinking about the the long term ramification or uh-huh. of, of having these type of experiences normalized. A hundred percent. Yes. I mean, of course they would because they would be bonded hormonally in a way that they literally can't be if they're not a part of it. Because he was having his own experience from his point of view because 
he saw the baby because he said when she, when she came out, my bag, my water bag burst. And he said, you know, it was just like this waterfall. And so he had his own experience as well that I can't mm-hmm. even speak to because I wasn't at his, you know, his point, his point of view. And it really is a magnificent thing. Hmm. So proud of you. Everybody in the world. Mm-hmm. So Thank awesome. What a, I'm proud of myself. Good. What a gift to your family. Yeah. <sighs> Well, thank you so much for your time and for the the courage to share your story. I know it will inspire many. Oh, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this space to be able to share without having any type of reservation, you know, that I can mm-hmm. share freely. <laughs> so I'm really totally. happy about that. Thank you mm-hmm. so much for providing or, or, you know, making sure that we have the space to do this type of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And that's it for today, my sisters. Check out everything we do, including one-on-one and group coaching, learn about our private membership, in-person retreats, and more on freebirthsociety.com. Our online courses are on freebirthsocietycourses.com, including our flagship course, The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Don't miss the Radical Birthkeeper School if you're ready to become the authentic midwife that women are searching for. Together we rise and the revolution starts inside each of us. I'll leave you with our Free Birth Society theme song, Wild Woman by Aruba Red. I honor you for the wisdom you held the ancient traditions of plant medicine and womb magic. I feel the spirit of the ancestors as I place my hands upon my belly. This sacred portal will be honored. Eons upon light beams of survival withstanding the eradication of our power by design. I will not allow the separation of our young to be forced upon me. My sisters will no longer birth in captivity. The picket line redefined from burning our wild women to paralyzing us and drugging our babes. Strapped down in a clinical white bed, drying up the milk from our breasts, keep your needles. My family will never again be doomed to chase those dragons or your poison. We reject your fear. We choose love. Everything with intention, death, ascension, I will fly and bring her back from the start.